Welcome to Lead the Way with Anna Gauker. Your guide, Anna Gauker, is on a quest of her own to find effective ways of creating change and inclusion in our communities. You have come to the right place if you believe in truth, justice, and coffee. Thanks for joining us. Hello, this is Lead the Way, and I'm Anna Gauker. I'm so excited. We're back with new episodes for you. Today's topic is something that I'm extremely passionate about elevating into the public conversation. Domestic violence is an issue that touches so many lives. Where domestic violence exists, shame grows, and these patterns often spread from one generation to the next. During 2020 in Wisconsin, there were 50 domestic violence homicide incidents, 60 domestic violence related homicide deaths, 36 victims were female, and 24 victims were male. This research is according to the annual Domestic Violence Homicide Report put out by End Abuse Wisconsin. I had the opportunity to speak with two professionals leading the charge in their efforts. Outreach Specialist Sia Shiab Vang and LGBTQ and Youth Program Director Cody Warner. We had a wide-ranging conversation about the work they do. As you listen, please think about ways you could get involved with this issue, whether it's with and abuse, another organization, or a shelter for domestic violence survivors in your community. Please consider donating time, money, or resources like food and clothes. After the interview, we'll also have information on how you can find out more about End Abuse Wisconsin specifically. Here's the interview. I'm so excited to talk to both of you. Can you tell me, Cody, about the overall mission of End Abuse Wisconsin? Yeah, definitely. Um, so End Domestic Abuse Wisconsin, or End Abuse, our mission is to promote social change that transforms societal attitudes, practices, and policies to prevent and eliminate domestic violence, abuse, and oppression. I'd say, like, whoever wants to answer any of the following questions, like, I think we can kind of do an overall discussion and... I don't know yeah. whose expertise is in what specific <laughs> area, but yeah, tell me about the services that Ed Abuse Wisconsin has to offer. Yeah, definitely. So um, End Abuse is a statewide nonprofit, and as, we are also a membership organization. So. Our members are made up of domestic violence survivors, local programs around Wisconsin and allied partners. Uh, and we were the only state coalition led by social policy advocates, attorneys and experts. So with all that being said, we, have a, we try to be as far reaching as possible when we're doing our statewide work um, because we, we know that uh, we need to build safer and healthier communities in Wisconsin. 
So to ensure that, we have folks that work on public policy and legal system advocacy. So we have folks working with um, legislators at the Capitol to promote um, policies and legislation that will benefit all survivors. Um, there have also been like policies that have come up, you know, that we haven't supported because multiple communities um, have, and specifically like communities of color have come out and said that like, you know, these bills are could actually um, negatively impact. So we wanna make sure that, you know, we're taking in all those voices and all those concerns and information. Then we also offer training and direct um, support. So with training, we provide free trainings, um, sometimes paid trainings throughout Wisconsin, um, varying on program specific. So DD services, prevention services, um, even outreach and administrative um, assistance to aid those programs around the state to have um, the capacity to really serve the victims and survivors that are walking through their doors. We play a big role in public awareness. Um, so we have a get help map on our website. And outside of the get help map, um, we also have been really focusing on social media during the pandemic. Um, so like wanna give a shout out to Kiyoshia, um, who's been doing an amazing job putting together all the social media um, for some of our programming, as well as Elise Bookbinder and our marketing partner. Uh, creative marketing resources. And the get help map um, is broken out into different sections of the state so that people can better identify um, which area of this uh, that they're in. And then they can find their own local resources, uh, whether that's domestic violence programming um, or like uh, from shelter to advocacy um, to receive those services from programs that are nearer to them. Um, and then we also have our statewide prevention and anti-oppression initiative. So we are centering young people and those most impacted by violence. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is actually with our upcoming um, teen summit, our annual teen summit. And this episode will likely be available after the event, but can you tell us a bit about what goes on at that event and what you are excited to share? Yeah, um, so I just want to mention before I pass the mic to Kiyoshia that um, even if the episode is going to be airing after the Teen Summit, this, we, this is an annual event. Um, that we that we host. So definitely don't feel that you're missing out too much because we will be back in 2022 as well. Yeah, so our team summer, we actually are going to have a few keynotes. Um, so we have two of our keynote speakers um, that we are going to be going on Facebook Live and that will be saved. And then we're also going to do mini highlight clips of each workshop and like the team summit. And so people can still live through our experience through our social media, um, which is the team summit on Facebook. Can you talk a bit about, like you were saying the Get Help map, are you collaborating with other organizations when you put out something like that? Or are there other ways that you collaborate? How does your organization fit into the larger picture of domestic violence services? Yeah, so um, with the Get Help map, um, all I believe all of the programs on our Get Help map are members of End Domestic Abuse Wisconsin. Um, and on the Get Help map, it has the different types of services that they offer, the different um, phone numbers, fax, um, TTY that you can call in or text, um, as well as direct links to the to their website. And so, how so we uh, work with our members to get all of that information so that we can 
put it um, within this map so that when people are searching for either the area that they're living in or the area that they might be fleeing to, um, to protect themselves and their loved ones, um, so that they're better able to connect right away with um, those or with domestic violence um, shelters, programs throughout Wisconsin. Um, one of the things, end abuse being the state coalition, uh, we don't provide direct service work. So we're not working necessarily directly with victims and survivors. And uh, we focus a lot on just really providing that support for advocates and being that voice, especially within the policy work to provide more, um, more work uh, that can be done in their communities. And really one of the things that End Abuse is, has been slowly growing a better understanding around and slowly trying to disseminate this information is that we understand that all oppression is connected, that we take an approach that allows change to take place at multiple different levels from the uh, systems like police officers and um, you know, the local boys and girls clubs to um, you know, the individual advocates or individual programs. Um, and really we want to make sure that we can reduce that violent behavior. Um, one of the other really cool things on the Get Help map is that we also offer um, resources for better intervention um, programs and treatment. Uh, so if folks are looking for those resources, they can find them on the Get Help map. And we wanna make sure that to really stop violent, the violent behavior so that um, folks can access safety and also identify and build healthy relationships, but they can carry on to future generations. Because ideally that's what domestic violence programming should be about, like building up the um, victims and survivors so that when they do leave, they can trust themselves that they have the skills to continue on with their lives um, and continue healing. So then uh, at the local community level, we're really thankful to partner with all sorts of different local programs um, who know their communities best. And uh, you know that's one of the things when victims and survivors do call in, um, like looking for direct services that we will try to connect them with those folks that are more local to them because they're the ones that are gonna know the, um, how to access those different community resources. Um, and then we also connect with different national work as well throughout, uh, throughout the agency. So we've worked nationally on elder abuse, on teen dating violence, domestic violence awareness month, um, and things like that. Will you tell me a bit about your individual roles, what you do, and how you fit into the overall umbrella? Yes. Uh, so my uh, my role and abuse or my title is the Dare to Know Youth Outreach Specialist. So Dare to Know is a campaign, a uh, part of our prevention team that started off as, you know, something that we just really wanted young people to know is like healthy relationships and how can we spread that in a way that we're also ending teen dating violence in our lives. So I, I started this job at a young age and you know like growing in it has also grown the project itself um and i play my role in the uh my role is really social media and making sure that we're posting things that are socially conscious for our young people but also showing them like yes we can have healthy relationships and we are doing amazing work at ending teen dating violence and so um, let's show people that this is like what we can do. And yeah, so my job is really fun. And I love working with uh, young people and like really talking to them about how um, they're spreading healthy relationships. Yeah. And I'd also like to, to add too that 
um, before being hired on. Kishia ha was a part of our statewide team council as well. So it's been amazing to the, to like just be a be able to witness Kishia grow from a youth that's super passionate about um, social justice and anti-oppression to now a uh, Gen Z leader within the movement. And so it's like just super excited to like be able to see that growth and that passion um, just like thrive even more um, within these different spaces. And to talk a little bit about what um, I do. So my title is the LGBTQ and Youth Program Coordinator. And so what I, um, how I typically describe my, uh, my the roles in my position is that one part is focusing on providing support to children and youth advocates. So providing, creating resources, um, finding resources, providing technical assistance, calls, emails, um, providing different networking events and training opportunities that are specific to children, children, youth, and family advocacy. Um, and then the next part of my work is around teen dating violence and prevention, which is where uh, Kiyoshia and I both uh, collaborate a lot together as well as with the rest of the prevention team. And then um, the last part is around serving the LGBTQ community um, revolving around intimate partner violence, hate violence, hookup violence, um, and sexual assault. Uh, so just to really summarize, I do a lot and have a wealth of resources and I'm so glad to collaborate with so many awesome people to help me um, be a, a better assistance to advocates across the state. You said the PSGA, yeah involved in this at a really young age. What brought each of you to End Abuse Wisconsin and what did you do before you were in your current roles? Uh, before I was working at End Abuse, I was working at a local domestic violence and sexual assault program in Southwestern Wisconsin. And so that program covered three different counties. Um, and I specifically worked within their youth programming. Um, I did a lot of overnight and support staff hours as well, was a prevention advocate for on top of my other roles um, for a little bit. And then um, I was hired on as the youth coordinator of that program. So working in all three counties and the shelter, providing direct services. Um, and then a few years later, the position at End Abuse um, opened up and I applied and received the position. And it's being involved or being hired on with End Abuse has definitely grown, helped me grow as not only an advocate um, and staff, but as a person by being able to have these really awesome um, and like deep and hard conversations with advocates around the state, but having those conversations um, in a place of like respect and love so that we can begin to heal ourselves living in, um, you know, this trauma that's all around us. Yeah, and then for me, I think I could spend a long time talking about how I got here, but um, I, I really like got into interviews because of my mom. <clears throat> um, she, you know, she had a lot of connections because she was also an advocate. Uh, but it really started because I was in a youth group called Sisterhood. And, um, you know, it was like home girls coming together, talking about, you know, the violence that we were seeing happening. And we were invited to the um, interviews teen council, uh, which allowed us to even have a better network of young people around Wisconsin for us to talk about like things that are affecting us. And then, um, you know, I really built the relationships with Stephanie, Cody, and Danny. And that's how I got the job, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just like my passion for the work and I'm really dedicated. Uh, for me, it's not a job or a career, but it's, it's my life. And so like, I, I'm really dedicated. 
I was just going to add too. Um, so the he she is in a in a role that was has been around now for three years. So like newly created, and um, when my supervisor and I were were thinking of like who should we hire for this position, there were three youth that we reflected on and like without question hands down and Kiyoshi definitely being one of them um because of all of that passion and all of that commitment to not just keeping it a like nine to five like this is what I do for a living and then I go home um like there's just a lot of passion and a lot of organizing um that has gone on and has definitely pushed this movement forward how would you say that each of you are uniquely suited for your roles at end of use? And when did that become clear to you? For myself, um, so I grew, like, I have a lot of experiences and history with um, domestic violence, sexual assault in my own life. Um, And in college, like I knew I wanted to work with kids, but I didn't know in what capacity. Um, And because I couldn't see myself like really working in an office all day, even though now I am being at the coalition, not doing direct service work. But um, like when I volunteered at the program that I later got hired on, in the first place, um, like the first day of volunteering there, like I left with the biggest grin on my face because it was just such amazing work. And like at that time, I was only volunteering with the uh, after school youth program. So like not even getting into like the advocacy side of things. Um, and so having that experience and that background has also helped because like I being a youth advocate, Like I don't have kids myself, um, which can be a pretty big barrier when working directly with victims and survivors who have children. Um, And so like oftentimes I would tell them like, you know, I don't have children myself, but I did live through it. Um, And I did live through a lot of fighting when I grew was growing up. And so I can sympathize and empathize with a lot of the things that the youth are saying. Um, And then Definitely, like, the LGBTQ work has always been on the forefront um, of my mind, just being a part of that community. Um, It's like, I identify as a queer man, um, and it's taken me, like, a long time to even get to that point. Um, And so just, like, being involved with NW's LGBTQ work before being hired on and then being able to kind of um, absorb that into my position and... um, be able to continue doing that work has definitely is a one of the joys of mine Um, being able to not only be working at an agency where I get to work with really awesome youth and adults but also working within the LGBTQ plus community on um, intimate partner violence sexual assault and uh, hookup violence. Um, As for me I I wouldn't, I think like a lot of young people are amazing and I think they could do this job, but I also think it takes, like I, I, I was telling uh, other, like my friends, I think it takes special people to do the job just because like we have to be passionate about it, but we also have to know how to take care of ourselves. But the last thing is that we have to be willing to fight, right? We have, and I think for me as like, you know, I'm also queer, but I am a cis um women and so you know like I you have to be willing to put your life on the line sometimes and like you know we're much bigger like I just play a role in end abuse but we're part of a bigger movement and ending like oppression and violence and I think it takes like special people to really know that right because we feel like you know we're just in this job because we have to but like again like I said before it it's my life and I think that's why like <clears throat> like this job is really made for me so yeah well I really appreciate both of you being so open with me and that definitely leads right into my 
next question, which is how is the LGBTQ plus community uniquely impacted by domestic violence? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that we really try and make sure that we're being cognizant about is we partner with a lot of LGBTQ organization, like uh, culturally specific organizations. Um, so the folks that are like on the ground within the community providing support and resources. And I think, so Diverse and Resilient um, does an annual pride survey. Um, they weren't able to last year because of the pandemic, but um, with the information that they got from 2019, um, they found that nearly 80% of those that they surveyed reported experiencing one or more type of intimate partner violence. And that they, that LGBTQ victims and survivors would rather go to an LGBTQ program, even if that program doesn't have domestic violence services versus going to a domestic violence program. And really that just comes out of fear from like all of the homophobia, transphobia um, and oppression that comes with being involved with this community, not even talking about like the other systemic oppressions that um, folks within the community might face that, you know, as a white cis man, like I don't have to face, right? Um, and so really making sure that when we're providing those resources to make sure that they are culturally re relevant, that we are creating resources that advocates can use um, to support those uh, individuals, as well as we know that violence against the LGBTQ individual is even more exacerbated um, when you, know, you add on those other oppressions. And so one reason we're grateful to have um, our workshop at the Teen Summit facilitated by Kai Pyle um, at the Teen Summit, where they're gonna be talking specifically about the LGBTQ Native American stories, histories, and current realities which are so important because that's an identity. Um, the two-spirit identity has really almost been like erased from um, existence because of colonization and um, continued push on white supremacy. So that's why we're super excited to continually be connecting with people so that uh, we can bring them in to start like really showing and normalizing like these are identities that are real. These are identities that are valid and these are identities that we're gonna support. Um, and so to help advocates, um, we provide a training series. Um, so once a year we will host a webinar specifically on an intersection of the LGBTQ um, identities. And then we also have a statewide LGBTQ um, task force. So this is made up of people who identify, advocates who identify, and I, as LGBTQ um, or a part of the community or allies that work directly with the community. And so the task force is really meant to, one, make uh, kind of like drive the LGBTQ work that NWS is supposed to be doing, um, as well as provide free trainings um, in person and virtually for domestic violence programs across the state. And so those trainings are a full day. Um, and we go through, you know, we do the 101 uh, because no matter what people say, there's always gonna be people that, in the group that need the 101. So we just go through that. Um, and then we really dive into like historical different types of historical oppressions and how um, intimate partner violence and sexual assault really affect this community. And then really go into um, some real world uh, scenarios and conversations, and then ultimately creating an action plan to then build on to support the LGBTQ community further, even after the training. What have each of you found that was the most 
important thing you've learned in this job that you're doing right now? I, I think to pick like one most important thing I've learned is really difficult. But like the one thing that I really learned and I've always kept is like, you know, like be uh, like be thankful of those who paved the way for me, but also like, you know, continue to pave the way for like the young people coming after me. Um, I think that's something important um, that I've learned and that I've really kept uh, with me throughout the work. Yeah, for myself, I think there the some of the things that kind of rise from the top or to the top is uh, something that came out of our statewide team council a few years ago and honestly has been kind of like my life um, mantra, if you will. Um, and so we were creating these norms and so, uh, as a part of the norms, it was recognize, apologize, do better. So recognize the harm that you've caused, whether intentionally or unintentionally and apologize quickly, don't belabor it, and then actively do better. So not just like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, and then continuing on about your day, but like really starting to dig in. And I think that's one of the things too that I try and let people know that like, you know, we're not just people, but advocates know that, you know, we're good people doing good work, but that doesn't, uh, stop us from harming others by our own unchecked biases and ways of being. Domestic violence is a topic that I've really been passionate about. And when I was in grad school, I actually did my master's thesis project researching the issue of domestic violence towards women with disabilities and what services are available and specifically targeting that group. Is that something that is discussed and abuse? And are there services that you know about that are available specifically for women with disabilities? Um, so we, yes, and. Um, so yes, we do have folks that uh, specifically work with different state agencies as well as domestic violence programs um, to collaborate services around people with disabilities. Um, and Sorry, that, it's a, a little bit of a touchy subject only because we had the person that was in that position was on our team um, and passed away last year due to COVID. Um, and so he was the one that was like really um, active in pushing uh, disability uh, uh, empowerment as well as, um, oh my gosh, forgetting my words, but he was really the person that we would go to for um, local elder work and disability, uh, people with disabilities um, to provide services as well as uh, building up capacity for folks. So like specifically, um, like we work a lot with Disability Rights Wisconsin. Uh, we collaborate in many different areas of our programming. Um, so we're, and then we also try, at least from the end abuse side, to really make sure that when we're when we're creating, when we're publishing, when we're presenting information, that the information is um, accessible in all the ways that they need to be. Um, so whether that's providing uh, language interpretation services, um, resources or materials um, that need specific requirements, whatever that may be. And we also try really hard when we're doing like in-person events to make sure that there are uh, that there is accessibility, even just like for the building itself, um, because we have come across some some places that still aren't quite ADA compliant. I don't know how it's 2021, but <laughs> you know. So 
that is one way that end abuse tries like internally as well as externally um, providing that providing those resources, providing that hope for people who might not necess necessarily always see themselves reflected in services. What can we out here as random civilians do to support your work? So uh, one of the things, you know, we are always uh, looking for sponsors, for donors. Um, you can become an individual member, a part of end abuse. Um, so those are just like some of the like, almost like knee jerk responses I have for that question. Um, I think also like finding us on our social medias, um, sharing on your personal social media if you feel comfortable with that, continuing to open that door for conversation. Um, because I, I know personally and firsthand that in Wisconsin, there's still a lot of communities that are in complete denial that um, domestic violence, sexual assault is even happening in their, their communities when we know it is, right? And so I think to continue to share what we're sharing to, you know, bring other people into the conversation as well that might not be talking about it. And, um, you know, we also have a lot of legislative um, events and legislative trainings and things like that. And people who may feel a little uneasy about like um, contacting legislators and whatnot, you know, we have resources that is almost like a template of like, you know, here are, here's why end abuse is or isn't supporting this legislation. And like, here's why it's really important for you to reach out to your legislators to make sure that they know that their constituents want them to either go forward with the bill or legislation or want, don't want them to. Um, and so I think that, that those are some other pieces that can really help uh, push our mission forward, as well as a lot of the different programming. Um, I guess, uh, Kishi, do you want to talk about ways other uh, ways folks can get involved with like the prevention work? Yeah, and also like, you know, if you're a young person listening to this, like sign up to our teen ambassador program, also known as TAP. Uh, all you have to do is go to dear to know wisconsinorg or you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Dare to Know Wisconsin. And you could just sign up for a TAP program. Um, and then also for like, you know, adults who wants to, you know, really support young people. We also have uh, our adult allies. And then, you know, just really follow our social medias. Uh, again, donate to NWs. And if you want to reach out to anyone at End Abuse, just go to endabusewisconsin.org. Perfect. Well, thank you both so much. I really appreciate you sharing everything you know about this area. And we will be sure to share your social media and your website and everything people need to know to get involved. That was Cody Warner and Sia Shia Vang of End Abuse Wisconsin. Thanks so much to both of them for sharing their insights. Our conversation gave me a lot to think about, and I hope you, the listener, feel the same way. You can find out more about their work at endabusewi.org. As always, all episodes of Lead the Way can be found on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, and make sure to rate and review when you subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Special thanks to Buzz Kemper 
for his voiceover artistry in the opening. This episode was brought to you by the time and talent of Tyler Willenbrink, Katie Cmac, and Jeremy Van Mill. I'm Anna Gauker. Until next time.